Thank you again, Mr. Conway. And I, I do apologize, I forgot to mention I had that at the bottom of my notes. But um, as far as some prayer requests and some updates, uh, there are a few that came out this week. Uh, I would just like to remind us all to, to keep those who are going through difficulties in our prayers. Um, one of our elders, Mr. Cordelieu, is dealing with quite a bit. There was a prayer request that came out for him. Uh, Mr. Olar yesterday, uh, there was a prayer request, prayer request that came out for him regarding his back and the difficulty he's having with that and, and having to be on his feet and, and working in the in the hospital setting. It's not a small thing. Um, we do also have some wonderful instances of God intervening. Um, we had uh, some good news for Mrs. Uh, Hughes regarding uh, her after she had her fall, her cast. She's, she's recovering well. Um, wonderful to be able to have the time. If you if you have the opportunity to give a call, I'll tell you what, Mrs. Hughes is a wonderful conversationalist, and so uh, you can have a great phone call with her if you'd like. Um, also, God watched over uh, the Curtises. They made it down to uh, Florida safely. They got their, um, I think it was early, it was either late Sunday or early, uh, early Monday morning. I'm trying to remember what Mr. Curtis said when I um, <coughs> texted them, but... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, please do remember them in prayers, everybody. All right. In uh, in grade school, I don't know how your school was. Maybe you had this experience. You guys ever have show and tell? Did any, was it, I don't know if there were different ages that you could bring something in from home to show. If you were either at school and you got to do this, or maybe you, you're a teacher and you've got to see kids bring in some interesting things as far as show and tell. But it's something that where I grew up, uh, it was a pretty small uh, country school. And so there, there was a lot of, uh, well, it's not too dissimilar from the area around here. But uh, the elementary that I went to, we only had, uh, we only had four grades in a kindergarten. Um, that's all that was there, one class of each of those. And um, there were a lot of farmers. And so, depending on the time of year, you didn't get to have show and tell every, um, as an individual, you didn't get to have show and tell every week. Um, but you kind of like cycle through, and bring things in the show. And so there were times that some of the farmers, uh, I think somebody brought their cow before they brought it to the fair. And so after school, we would have the opportunity to go out and go you see this calf. Uh, or um, some people would bring in chicks in the spring. And um, it's just an opportunity for kids to be like, oh, look at this thing that they're very excited about. And they would want to show you. But my most memorable show and tell was not a, an animal I mean, because there were times I think my family at one time we brought goats afterwards because we would raise we had kind of like a little hobby farm sort of thing we would do goats or we would do bring in little chicks and things like that and you could pass them around or um, we had uh, incubators in classes one time so we could have that sort of experience but the most memorable one that I had uh, I'll set it up I'll set it up a little bit here but while we're setting up let's turn back to uh, Genesis chapter 1 because this concept of a show and tell this idea of having an excitement for what you want to show people is not something that is uniquely human it's something that that our father has put there and it's something that is is there for a reason and we'll look here in Genesis chapter 1 and we see God putting things together. We see that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth, or face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide uh, the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, firmament and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. 
something like this. Uh, just, we're kind of going, we're going through the creation process, but as you go along, you see God making things, and it's good. There are times where uh, in our house there are a number of kids, something will be made. It'll be maybe not fully done, but they'll come and they'll show you all along the process. There are actually things like this in work, right? Where you have these markers that you're supposed to be hitting along the, along the, the line, uh, along the terms of the contract or along the terms of the project that you're doing. You have these markers set in place so you know that you're, you're, you're progressing along. And it's exciting when you hit those markers. And so, like, my kids will bring something, and they'll bring something to show me. He's like, oh, look what I made. And you're like, that's great. What are you building? And they'll tell you. And they're very excited to show you about what they've created or why they've made it this way. And if you ask them, there will be a great explanation. We see our Father here making everything, creating everything. And at the end, it is good. Then, let's jump over to... Um, Verse 24, so it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, so that each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, On the heels of making all of these things, He says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So everything that I just made, I'm going to give it to them. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. And then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Look what I made you. See, I've given you every herb of the field. I can just imagine. I mean, it's fun during the spring when you start to see things crop up. They'll, they'll come through the ground. You can see the shoots, whether it's of the grass or of the various flowers. There's a portion of our yard um, that uh, I know that the milkweed will start to come up. And so I'll purposefully avoid that section because, you know, butterflies and all the other fun things that come through and want to have the milkweed. So you can see the caterpillars. So I know that they're going to come up there. So I watch it. And you know where they're going to grow because of the, the seeds and, and where they've been in the past. But God is showing man every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields fruit to you, it, is, it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. And God saw that he had made, saw everything that he had made. Indeed, it was very good. So the day and the morning were the sixth day. I kind of imagine, I mean, later on, if you go into the account, you'll see him bring all the animals, kind of like he did with Noah, but he brings all the animals before Adam. He says, look what I made. Look how cool this one is. What are you going to name it? Right? And so then Adam names it. But it's kind of like, This is maybe dumbing it down, take the analogy as far as you'd like. It's like a kid anticipating show and tell. Because when you know that you get to bring something to school to show your friends, your peers, I mean, you're considering, what am I going to bring? Okay, hold on. What do I have that is nifty? What do I have that is different? What, do I, what would be something that's impressive? You're thinking of these things that you bring to show and tell. At least, maybe that was just what was going through my mind. But when you get to bring this, it's like, you don't just be like, oh, and this is a dirty sock, right? You don't do that. You bring them wow things, right? And God is bringing them before Adam and Eve. He says, I made all of this. You can eat this. You can eat this. Oh, and this tree over here. Everything from the trees, everything from the ground. I made it for you. Look, here it is. I can just, I get the sense of that kind of excitement as I read through Genesis 1 and what he did. Let's go to Genesis 13. We'll see here the situation. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 is where we'll pick it up. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 it says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are northward and southward, eastward 
and westward. Look all around you. Look all around you. Lift up your eyes and look all around. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. I wonder if he was on a hill. Because you remember when he was standing there with Lot, Lot looked out and he could see the plain. And so he went down to the plain. So I imagine that they're still fairly high up. Right? After Lot had separated. Here in Illinois, a little bit more difficult to do. To be like, oh, well, that's a lot of space. Right? But if you're high up enough on a plain, you say, oh... That's where the water is. That's where everything... Essentially what God's telling him is, it doesn't matter what Lot chose. Everything that you see, I'm going to give to you and your descendants. Yeah, Lot's got that, but... So he chose to take his herds down there. But everything that you see, I'm going to give you. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Now... I know this is just words, but now I want you to walk the land that I'm going to give you. Walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth tree of, of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Just like God did with Adam and Eve, God does with Abram. He says, okay. You thought it was good before, right? I mean, you've already walked. I told you, leave your, leave your house, leave your family, leave your nation and go where I tell you and I'm going to make of you a great nation. Now, I'm going to show you what that is. I'm going to show you the whole breadth of it. I'm going to show you where to walk. We're gonna, and essentially, it's kind of like a surveyor's job. We're going we're gonna to walk around. You're going to see how big this is. And can you imagine? Now, Abram had enough people that he could raise up 300 armed men to go after the kings and get his nephew back, right? So it wasn't like a small household per se. But, it doesn't take a lot for you to feel really small in a space. Like, drive west, right? You get about into Kansas, and you're like, wow. <laughs> when was the last exit, right? And you're in a car, but you can feel really small. Now, do that, get out of the car, and start walking. You can feel very small very quickly. And then you realize, wait, God's giving all of this to me and my descendants? My descendants are going to be like the sands of the... I've been walking in sand for eons. This is a lot of descendants. But God goes and he takes Abram and he says, I'm going to show you. He was so excited to show Abram. He's like, okay, you've, you've now gotten to the point where you're listening. You've put everything behind you that needed to be behind you. laid aside all the weights that were holding you down. And now I want to show you the land I'm going to give you and all of your descendants. I sense a little bit of excitement there. But the thing about show and tell, again, I've kind of alluded to some of the strategy that you play as a, you know, as a young kid, a grade schooler, when you're thinking about this, because you have an idea on who is going to share something. Like, this happened throughout the year. In my school, it happened on Fridays. And you could kind of uh, get an idea to sign up. You would have a couple different show and tells, but there were, we, it's not like you had 30 kids showing their show and tell thing every Friday, because, I mean, then you wouldn't get anything done. So it's just a couple people. And so you knew that you had to space out throughout the year. So if you waited until, like, January, you knew that everybody's going to bring whatever they got for Christmas. Or if you waited until this other time of year, then they were, they, they were going to bring these other things. And so you're kind of trying to figure out, okay, if I want to bring something that's interesting, if I want to bring something that's nifty, cool, exciting, that people would find intriguing, you had to kind of pick your time of the year. But then you also had to... It wasn't, it was like, who wanted to show theirs first? Well, if you know who's going, it's like, oh, I can't go after that person. If I go after that person, I saw what they had on the bus. It's not as great, or my, my thing's not as great as theirs. And so there's a balance to that. There's a balance to that. And sometimes, I've been there where what you bring, just, oh, the person who went before you, that was a really cool thing. What I brought... Ooh, no! Can I pick a different day? Nope, this was your day. What'd you bring? Or maybe you forgot it at home. You ever do that? Where like you had your show and tell thing? It's like you grabbed your lunch, but you forgot the show and tell thing. You're like, oh, so now you have nothing to show. And it's depressing. Sometimes those things can fall flat. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 16. Here we are, Moses, in the prequel to this, has a little bit of concern. It's like, hold on, 
you're asking me to go to these people. Uh, I, uh, I ran away from these people. Um, but you're asking me to go back. What do I need to do? And God tells him in verse 16. Exodus chapter 3, verse 16. God says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. So God says, I've seen it. I have seen it. And, and I will bring you up. I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. I've seen where you are now. I've got some, something spectacular to show you. Something that's even better. A land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt and you'll say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us and now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So God tells Abraham, it's like you tell them what you're going to show them. You tell them who sent you and they're going to want to see it. They're going to want to come and see this land flowing with milk and honey. So they'll even go with you then to the king of Egypt, to Pharaoh, and say, you know what? Let us go out and go do these things. Later on down the road, let's jump ahead a, a few decades to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. God has brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. They got to see it by His mighty hand. Right? That land that He promised them, that He said, you know, Moses, the way you get them to come and follow you. Because Moses is like, oh, but why are they going to listen to me? He says, you tell them who's sending you. You tell them the God of their fathers, Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, is coming to make good on his promise. Remember all of that show and tell time that I had with Abram? As he grew to become the father of the faithful. And I showed him all of that land. You guys know the history, right? Tell them, I'm coming to bring you to that. And now here we are. A little bit more than 40 years later. Numbers chapter 13, verse 17. Moses then sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, the land of the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, all the ites. He says to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests uh, there or not. Be of good courage, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was a season of the first ripe grape, ripe grape. So he says, okay, I want you guys to go spy out the land. Now, Abram already did this hundreds of years before, right? 400 years before, he had walked the land, God had shown him everything that he was going to give them, and now his descendants who number, whose numbers are like the stars of the sky, like the sand of the sea, are now going in, and they're getting the opportunity, in that way, to walk it a little bit, to see what is there. So they went up and spied, verse 21, they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as uh, Rahab, near the entrance of Hamath, and they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahimim, uh, uh, Ahimim um, Shishai and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Uh, Heber, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they carried it between two of them on a pole. You know, you've seen, if you go back to uh, the old worldwide days, you've seen that uh, uh, picture of the men coming through, and they've got the pole, and they've got like this massive cluster of grapes on it. A wonderful visual. They also brought some of the pomegranates and the figs. And the place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the clusters which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. And they brought back words to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. It's another show and tell. God says, I'm going to take you out of this steaming, difficult, I mean, just a 
just a dumpster fire of a, of a city, a nation that you live in. You're, you're being persecuted. I'm going to take you out of that. I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Forty, Actually, no, this isn't 40 years later. I'm sorry. I misspoke earlier on. This is before that. So this isn't 40 years later. This is a couple, this is down the road when they're, when they're spying out the land, however long it took them to get there to, to, the, uh, to the promised land, um, at least at the doors of it. Right? And so they spy this out. They're looking at it. And it's like, this is God making good on his promises. He says, you know, I told you. I'm going to show you. You ever have that where, um, as you're leading up to... Uh, Show and tell. I've had it where like, oh, I'm gonna bring this, and you're like, oh, now I can't bring that because they're talking about what they're gonna bring the next day. He's like, I was thinking about bringing something that was like that, and I can't bring that now. You know, somebody brought the had the new, newest, latest, and greatest super soaker, and they're gonna bring it in in, in May, right before the end of school, and then the teacher has to be like, no, you can't bring it out at the recess because we know what's gonna happen. And they they foresee the calamity, but it's like, oh, now I can't bring that. God says, I'm gonna show you, and then he goes, he takes them and he shows them, and they see it. And it's amazing. It is truly a land flowing with milk and honey. And Israel had the opportunity to see it. Well, in this very memorable account for me, I think it's somewhat similar to this. And maybe you respond in a similar fashion when you have an experience in life that is so indelibly etched in your mind you can probably go back and maybe play it again. You know, the old be kind, rewind, and you, 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 just, you, you can just turn it back and you can play the video over and over. But for me, that show and tell actually began before Friday. It started on a Wednesday. I mean, if you recall, I think it was in, I was in first grade, not I think, I know. I know that I was in first grade. I know that I was in first grade, and on a Wednesday, we would have these midweek Bible studies, always in the evening. It was in the fall of my first grade year. And I know that it was in the fall of my first grade year because every fall we would go and we would find an Olin Mills and we would do a family portrait. You remember getting all the family portraits, right? And so you'd dress up. And I was wearing dark brown slacks. I had a light tan blazer jacket that I had, white shirt, and I remember the tie. The tie was a, it was like diagonal striped and I had a thick dark brown stripe and then I had a, a blue stripe that was outlined on each side by thin white stripes and so it was like just diagonal clip-on I didn't like the clip-ons because they would they could just dig right into your neck but I remember this because as we were preparing to get ready for the Bible study um, and I'm getting dressed and as you're growing and things like that clothes fit or don't fit as nicely as you would want them to when you're a kid and my shoes were not comfortable and my shoes weren't comfortable because during the summer I ran around barefoot we would work in the garden we would do various other things running around climbing trees blah 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 this is what you do as a kid when you're that young and um, over the course of the summer I developed on my big toe uh, is my right toe I developed a planter's wart. That can, when you put pressure on it, be uncomfortable. And so over the course of the summer, I'd actually had this planter's wart frozen off a couple times. Kept coming back. And so as I'm putting on my dress clothes and my dress shoes, and our family is trying to, you know, get ready to get out the door, those of you who are parents, or maybe those of you who are kids, might be able to commiserate here, the discomfort that you get from having to put your feet into something that isn't as loose as you would want when you have a wart that is getting pushed on and the pressure and oh, it's just, you start to feel like an Israelite wondering where the food is and where the water is and how come we're out here and why are we still walking? And you might get a little bit higher pitched and the vocal cords tighten up and you get a little whiny and when you've had the same problem for a while and you have a father like I have, a limit gets reached to where he's like, we're done with this. We've had it frozen a couple times. I'm tired of you complaining about this wart, Nathan. And so, my father in his fix-it fashion decided that that was the time, right before going to Bible study on Wednesday, 
right before family portraits that this is going to get taken care of. And so, there was a little bit of excavation occurring, and the wart was removed. I can still feel it, as far as like, I mean, because if you've had a wart, they're very sensitive, which is why when you step on it, 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 it hurts. And so, the wart, planter's warts, are, planter's warts are more under the surface than they are outside of the surface. And um, uh, cayenne pepper is a very good cauterizer, you might know. And so what I thought was a tight shoe earlier on in the afternoon got tighter because now I had a toe that was wrapped, but the wart was gone. And we went and we had pictures at Olin Mills, and we went and we had Bible study. And uh, guess what I brought to, to show and tell? Nobody else ever had brought one of those because I put that puppy in a Ziploc bag. And uh, there are memorable moments in life. <laughs> it is funny. There are very memorable moments in life, and they just stick with you. And I mean, I know exactly what I was wearing. I know how old I was. I remember sitting there as my dad's like, oh, no, don't do it, Dad. He's like, no, we're done with this. I'll tell you, never got a planter's ward in that spot again. I don't think I got any others after that. I think God was like, that's enough. One is enough. But I brought it. And everyone in the classroom had the same exact response that you did. It's like, no, why would he do that? What is that? And all the guys are like, whoa. And the teacher's like, should I let him pass it around? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you know, it's like, I'd rather them go, go pet the goat after school out in the yard. That, that, I don't know why. <laughs> Your parents let you bring that. What happened? You know, very memorable. Very memorable. Let's go to Matthew 17, because I think that, again, I'm... I am sure that there's something in your life that as you have gone through and experienced it, it is just as indelibly marked in your mind as that show and tell was for me. I knew no one else was going to bring something like that. And here we see in Matthew 17 something where God now... In the flesh is Jesus Christ here. John chapter 17 verse 1 says, After six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And when his disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. When he had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but, only, but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Can you imagine something like that? For those who are older, you probably remember right where you were when you learned that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. It's likely that for those who are a little bit younger, you remember where you were when the space shuttle exploded. You remember where you were when the Twin Towers were showing across the screen on TV. I remember bringing a wart as a show-and-tell thing in first grade. I believe that if we were to have a conversation with Peter, James, and John, they would be able to tell you exactly what they were wearing, how they were oriented on that mount, maybe what they had for breakfast on that day. Because it is just... I'm going to guess. Just gonna, I don't think it's a far reach, but I'm going to guess that they know those things because it's so indelibly marked. Because God said, I want to show you something. Jesus said, 
I mean, these, these were the three who were the closest to him. I would like to give you a peek, a vision of what is to come. Just like God had told Adam and Eve, oh, look at everything I made for you. And he told Abram, look at what I'm going to give you. And he told the children of Israel, look, this is going to be yours. And Jesus told his disciples, his three best friends, he said, look, this, this is what it is. And they were flabbergasted. They couldn't believe it. And he says, don't tell anyone until after the resurrection. This is for you guys. This is for you guys to understand. This is for you three. I chose you three to come and look and to see this. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. This excitement that we can feel that so is so necessary for us when we're talking about memory, when we're talking about why it is that we can go back and recall what occurs on these important moments in our life. They get tied in with our emotion. Some people will have a more um, a smell. Uh, a smell will come to mind. And I have other, other experiences in life where um, if I smell something, a different memory comes in. It's very, very connected. Music is the same sort of way where if you have uh, music that is a part of uh, an experience, you might have a closer tie with that. But here, Exodus chapter 20, these things that all tie together for us as far as our reaction. God has been wanting to show us something throughout time, and we've seen it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, God has just spoken to the children of Israel. Through Moses, he has the Ten Commandments. And all the people witnessed the thunderings and the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood far off. And then they said to Moses, you speak with us. We will hear that. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off. But Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. People respond differently. Some of the men here in the audience there was a bit more of a chuckle on their face. We're like, oh yeah, he brought that. <laughs> it was the same thing with the, with the boys in my class. We're like, whoa, that's gross. Can I touch it? Right? Keep it in the bag. All the things that go on with the conversation. And all the girls are like, ooh. And you have different responses to something. To what you're like, oh, I just want to show this to you. This is so cool. And God says, I want to show you something. And Moses got it. He says, oh, this is God just, he's, come, he's near. He's testing you so that you're going to fear him and understand. And people are like, ooh, I, I did, uh, it's kind of weird. The whole mountain is thunder. It's scary. I don't think I want to, I don't think I want to go see what he has. I don't want to do that. It's, it's actually, I mean, just a, a testament to this. The, the old, uh, um, when you would have carnivals, right? You would have the thing that's behind the curtain. Who's willing to pay? Uh, it might be scary. It might be something. I don't know. No, I'm not going to pay a nickel to go see that. I'm just going to stay over here on this side and ask my friend who was brave enough to go and look and see what it was. What it was, right? People respond differently to these things. Even though our excitement might be there, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate. We see this again in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I think it's interesting as we get to see what John has written because he was one of those three. He's one of the three who got to see the Son of Man, one of his best friends, transfigured. And he got to see him glorified. If you read the account in Mark, I think it's interesting because it said uh, that his uh, robes were uh, became white. And it says, whiter than you can possibly get with any normal washing. <laughs> Uh, something to that effect. But it's like, they were really white. 
But John, who had seen that here in John chapter 6, verse 52, we see here another response of people. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Because Jesus Christ had been talking about being the bread of life. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This is what I want to give you. This is what I want to show you. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who? I, I don't get what he's saying. Who can understand this? And then Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, and he said to them, Does this offend you? Verse 66, And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Just like Israel did when given the opportunity to have a direct personal relationship with God, they didn't understand it. And Jesus said, Are you going to go too? He says it down in verse 67, and Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? You wonder why there was only 120 on the day of Pentecost? It says many of those who had followed him left, because this is a difficult thing to understand. I'm not sure I want to follow this guy. He's a little bit crazy. That mountain's a little bit burny and shaking, and uh, I'm not sure about that. I know you, you seem pretty excited about this show and tell, but I am not on board with it. And many left. You get the variance of response to a show and tell, and, and I, to be fair, mine was a wart. It was not this, right? I am not coming to equate the two, but you do see that there are differing responses that people will have to the same thing. Some people are like, oh, yes, that's great, and they will have the same show of excitement and the same buy-in. And other people are like, mm, pass, not interested, no thanks. And so many of Jesus Christ's disciples went back. We've only gone over a, a couple of examples, but there are many of these in Scripture where God is essentially saying, Hey, come see what I have. Come see what I want to give you. This is what I want to bestow upon you. And for millennia, God has been trying to have a show-and-tell sort of experience with people. And he's walked through and he's shown them. And many people, many people have said yes, but even more have said, no, it's too difficult to understand. For us, though, today, let's go to John chapter, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We are at a point in time where God wants to know how we're going to respond to Him. See, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you are in life, how long you've been following God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Because that point is always right in front of you. It's right in front of me. Every day. We have a choice about what we're going to do and how we're going to respond to what God is showing. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. The world does not get this whole show and tell thing. No, they're not interested. So therefore, by extension, they're not going to be interested in us. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Again, John had the opportunity to see Jesus Christ transfigured. He, if anyone, would have a pretty good idea of what we're going to see. He's like, 
right now, we have an idea. We have an idea. We don't yet know what we're going to be. It's not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. We read in Genesis, um, Genesis 1 that we are made in God's image. In the image of Him, man and woman, we are made. And when Jesus Christ returns, we will be as He is. As He's revealed, so then will we be. And it's, again, the big show and tell. This is what we're striving for. This is what we're looking. We're going to be able to see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. If this is the vision that we have, if this is, if this is what we're also excited about, being able to see, I mean, I remember, again, you try to figure out on the bus, the other people who are going to be doing show and tell, it's like, oh, sometimes they'd be really cagey about it. They didn't want to reveal it until, ta-da, right in front of the class. Like, oh, you get the full effect. But then other times, you get sneak peeks. You try to figure out what they're bringing. Oh, really? You brought that on? And so they just kind of just murmur through the school. Like, this is someone else bringing this. Oh, somebody's mom is coming afterwards and bring this. Oh, they're brownies. You know, whatever it is that they're bringing for show and tell. But it's like, so you kind of like play it a little bit differently. Each kid would do it differently. But you could have kind of this, this build up to what is going to be there. Those who buy in, everyone who has this hope in what God is revealing to be the end, right, purifies himself just as he is pure. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Here, towards the end of the chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Paul writes, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Just want you guys to know. No, it's not a word. I didn't bring it. No. <laughs> childish things, right? I put that away. It's a story I'll tell, but it's not something I'm going to do now. But there is a similarity. You put those things away. For now, we see in the mirror dimly. We have an idea. We think we have an idea. But we haven't even seen it yet. We have a taste of it. We may have walked the breadth of the land. We may have seen some of the fruit. We may understand a lot more because we have His Holy Spirit guiding us, but it is but a taste. And if this is exciting, if thinking about a cluster of grapes that takes two men between them uh, on a pole is, is, is exciting when you think about that, if grasping the miracles that have happened in your life is exciting, well, just wait. For we see in a mirror dimly but then we're going to see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall, uh, but then I shall know just as I also am known. We're looking forward to that time. We're going to be able to truly and fully see what God has been wanting to show us. Because we don't, we think we might know, and we have an idea. We have an idea, but we haven't done it perfectly. We have. We have yet to, there, I mean, you can have one perfect person, and we, this world has only ever seen one perfect person. But unless you have multiple perfect people interacting perfectly, well, then you can see what it's actually going to be like. And we don't even have, we don't have that. Maybe on a good day, we do one good thing, and it doesn't come back to bite us, right? Or we don't snip at our spouse, or we don't do whatever the things are that we humanly do, to mess up the perfection of love and compassion and understanding that God has. God's like, this is what I'm trying to build. I'm giving you a foretaste. It's a sneak peek. It's like, oh, somebody just let slip a, oh, oh, I think they're going to be bringing this to show and tell. Maybe. Oh, I thought it was that. But everybody starts getting excited. And we have the opportunity to have that. Luke chapter 10 here as we wrap up. Luke chapter 10, verse 23. Luke chapter 10, verse 23.
God's desire for us is to have us look in that mirror, recognize that we're only seeing a dim image, but also by extension, understand that if that is what we see in the dim image, how much more amazing is it going to be when we get to see it fully? Peter, James, and John got to see Jesus Christ transfigured for but a moment. They averted their eyes, they look up, and He's the only one again. Abram only got to see the land as he walked it. The children of Israel got to see it, and then they had to wait for 40 years to go in because of how they responded. Anything that we see, it's but a foretaste. It's but a small amount. But here in Luke chapter 10, verse 23, this is what God wants us to do. Luke chapter 10, verse 23, He turned to His disciples. He's telling him when he's talking about the Spirit, he's talking about what God has done or is going to do. He says, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. What we have the opportunity to see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. God has given us the opportunity to have a sneak peek at the best most amazing show-and-tell ever. What He desires from us is that we would go about our life in such a fashion that we will be the ones whispering to our best friends and to the others on the school bus who will listen about the amazing thing that He's bringing to show-and-tell. They need to be there. They need to see this. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> You can't even imagine how awesome it's going to be. We get to be, in that way, the giddy school kids who are just excited for what our dad is going to be bringing because it is awesome beyond imagination. So as we go out, let's make sure that we are excited, that we are on fire for God's show and tell.